Okay, today's stuff we're going to be learning is Nidarim Daf Zion. Today's stuff is sponsored by Rachel Chefetz in loving memory of her paternal grandmother's yurt site, Esther Bat Abraham, Zechonal Abracha. And today's stuff is dedicated in memory of Rabbi Meir Shapiro, the Daf Yomi visionary on his 89th yurt site. Him to thank for having our group together for learning um, for his initiative of creating Daf Yomi in 1923. Almost nearing 100 years. Okay, um, we are going to get started with um, continuation of the questions of Rav Papa. So Rav Papa asked yesterday, Yeshad the Kiddushin, Yeshad the Pe'ah. Again, his question was, while it's clear that there's Yad the Neder, which we derived already before, the only thing that wasn't clear about a Yad the Neder is, and, and Yad the Neder includes Yad the Korban, right? Any kind of language where you're designating, promising something like, a vow, right? A neder for a korban is all connect, connected. It's another type of vow. That was all if you're clear about your language. Where Now, a yad is always going to be a little bit unclear because what's a yad? Cut off language. It means you didn't say the entire sentence. So there's always a small possibility that maybe you meant something else, but it's a very small possibility. I want to like, modify what I said yesterday and basically saying it's like a percentage game, right? 95% it's clear, right? It's probably 95% chance or 90% chance that you meant to take on a vow. That's going to count. Yad she'eno muchach is already, I don't know, 50-50, 60-40, something like that, where it's already a little bit less clear. That's not our question right now. That was the debate on the previous part, which is, you know, on, on Daf Hay, where we had this whole deliberation and continued on Vav Amad about a Yad she'eno muchach. Is it Yad? Isn't it? We saw Shmuel, we saw Rav Abaye. Now, Rav Papa is asking, let's go back to the Yad itself, the one where it's pretty clear. And then the question is, does it work in other areas as well, where we have wording that creates something, where it's Kiddushin, whether it's Pea, setting aside your field, what part of your field are you setting aside in words? And in all the questions that Rapapa is going to ask, which are another two we're going to get to today, and then Ravina is going to ask a similar question, we're going to have the explanation of what is a case of Yad. In this case, it's going to be where you said to somebody or something, I'm doing this, right? I'm betrothing you, or I'm making this the corner of my field. And then you said, and this, or and her. But you didn't say, and her, I'm also doing Kiddushin, and her, and, and this I'm also setting aside as pe'ah. And because there's an outside chance, again, it's very outside chance that you didn't mean that, but that's why it's called a yad, because it's cut off. You didn't say the full sentence, even though we're pretty clear that you meant what we think you meant, which is you meant to betroth the second woman. You meant to designate more of your field as pe'ah. Is it or not going to be considered valid? And we ended with this hekesh. I want to mention it because we're going to have another very similar hekesh, in chapter 23 of Tvarim, verse 22, in another minute, we're going to have a Hekesh on verse 24. That's why I want to mention it in that same chapter, which is, it said there, Nedr Lashem Lokecha, which they understand to be a korban. And then it says, Meimach, which is an indicator, uh, is the darshan to mean Leket, Shecha, and Pe'ah. And from there, they say, ah, let's make a Hekesh, right? There's a Hekesh between the two. What's true for one is true for the other. Does this Hekesh go across the board? I mean, if there's Yad the Korban, there's Yad for Pe'ah. Or does it not go across the, it does not cover everything. Maybe it's only limited to the context of that verse, which was Baal Ta'achir, which was not delaying, but yet having nothing to do with the law of Yad. And that's a deliberation about Pe'ah. Do we say the Hekesh fully or not? Some of the commentaries say the reason why we have a debate here about this Hekesh is because it's a unique kind of Hekesh. Because it doesn't actually say, Leket, uh, it doesn't actually say, sorry, pe'ah in the verse. It's only derived from a word in the verse because it's already a hekesh on a derivation, maybe it's weaker. So some people want to distinguish between this kind of hekesh and a hekesh, for example, that we saw in the beginning of our, of our Masechet between Neder and Nazir, where they were both actually explicitly mentioned in the same verse. So now we're going to get to question number three out of four of Rav Papa. Yesh yad l'tzdaka o en yad l'tzdaka? Staka, as we often, we might know, right, shuls have appeals often and people make commitments to charity in words. It's now going to be clear that if you make a commitment to charity in words, it's valid, okay? If I say I'm giving, even if I just say I'm giving this money to charity, 
That money can't be used for other things. That money needs to be given to charity. That's what seems to be implicit in what this is talking about. The question is, what if there's a yad, a verbal designation that's cut off, that's unclear? So yesh yad l'tzedakah, en yad l'tzedakah. So again, the Gemara says, hechidami, what's the case? Ilema da'abar hadein zuza l'tzedakah v'hadein nami. If you say this money will be for charity, and this also, well, it's obvious what you're saying. Hayit tzedakah atzmahi. Okay, we already know this. This is the, the recurring line, the, the refrain that we keep hearing from all the cases. The exact same cases that we're asking about. And the kigon de amar hadin velo amar nam. If he said, or she said, this money is for charity, and this, but not saying, and this what? Hadin nami tzedaka kama, right? In other words, again, 90% chance you meant, and this means, and this also is for charity. O dilma the hadin, my the hadin, the nafkuta ba'alma kama. Maybe you meant, and this. I'll use for my own purposes, right? This money is for charity, and this is for me to use when I go shopping, okay? And he just didn't finish his sentence. Okay? He cut himself off before he said, and this I'm going to use to spend on my own expenses. So now what's the deliberation? Just like in the previous. Do we say, that there's a hekesh between charity and sacrifices? Okay, again, this is two psukim later than where we were. Dichtiv b'ficha zotzdaka. The word b'ficha appears in that verse. We're going to read the verse right now. As I said, it's Varim chapter 23, verse 24. Motsas v'techa you have to keep to your word. V'asita ka'asher nadarcha l'ashem alokecha. And you should keep your word if you vowed to God, which is a sacrifice. Nidava asher dibarta b'picha or a voluntary something, okay, something you volunteered, which you said with your words. So the drasha here is, what did you say with your words? It's charity. Interesting question why charity would be something that would be something you expressed in words, but that's what they explain here. And therefore, in that verse, there's neder to God, that's a korban, a sacrifice, which we already know, this yad the korban, and it has stuck in it. So do we say, since it's comparable, it's compared in that pasuk. It's just supposed to korbanot. Ma korbanot yesh lan yad avstaka yesh la yad. So just like sacrifices have yad, this is the exact same deliberation we had in the previous case. Therefore, this would have a yad staka o dilma labalta achiru di takish. Or maybe the hekesh is only for the context of those verses, which is pay it up on time. So if you say you're going to give charity within the year, you know, for this year, this calendar year, then you have to give it within that calendar year. And that would be maybe what it's teaching you. And if you delay, you've transgressed a Torah prohibition. But maybe it's not, and it's only coming to teach you that, but not anything else. And therefore, we wouldn't know whether there's Yad that's stuck or not. Yesh Yad Lehefker, question number four. Oh, Dilma, Ein Yad Lehefker. What is Hefker? So we know this, if you're, if you're living in Israel, especially in the Shemitah year, right now we're past the Shemitah year, but all our fruits that are growing on our tree most of our trees are still Shemitah because they budded in the Shemitah year. And what you're supposed to do is make your backyard, you know, your fruit trees, hefker, ownerless. State, in words, this is ownerless. Anyone can come and take. People also put up signs, right, to let people know because no one's going to know that I said it was ownerless. But basically, you can render something ownerless with your words. So again, what if I have a yad? And again, it's a cutoff language. Does that work or not? So now the Gemara says, what do you mean you're asking this question? It's the exact same thing as charity. Now, why is it the exact same thing as charity? So at this point, the Gemara assumes, it's an interesting assumption, that when you make something ownerless, why would I make something ownerless? So if it's Shemitah, I understand I'm making it ownerless because I need to. In a different case, why would I make something ownerless? Because I want to give it to charity. Okay? So basically, it's like Tzedakah, because who am I rendering it ownerless for? Probably the poor people. So what they're saying is the following. So isn't that the same question we just asked? Why are you asking it separately? To which the Gemara says, im tim tzaloma kama. It's a structure of an im tim tzaloma, which we're going to see. It's kind of similar to something we're going to see later today also, which is, if you say this, then I'm going to ask another question. So here goes. Im tim tzaloma yesh We didn't have an answer to the question in yesh or not. 
So the question of hefker is actually premised on the question of tzedakah. And they want to read like this. If you say there is yad litzedakah, de'en hekesh lemechze, because you can't make a, a juxtaposition and say, well, these two things are juxtaposed in the verse. And we're going to learn some things, but not other things. No such thing. As again, maybe there is such a thing, but there's a debate about it. So if you were to say there's no hekesh lemechze, you can't partially learn from korbano to uh, tzedakah. And therefore, we're going to assume that tzedakah has yad, just like korbanot. Well, hefker, now I want to ask if you're going to say yes to the previous question, which we don't even know. Right? So we have two tracks. Either you say no to the previous question, in which case it's also no to hefker. But if you say yes, and we can learn tzedakah from korban, now comes the further question, which is miam rina, he, sorry, hefker. When it comes to healthcare, mi amrina hain tzedakah. Do we say it's the same thing as charity? Oh, Dilma, shan tzedakah, did tzedakah lochazi ele lanim, aval healthcare ben lanim, ben lashirim. Or maybe tzedakah is different from healthcare because tzedakah is only for poor people, whereas healthcare is for poor and for the rich. And therefore, maybe it has a different law than tzedakah. Okay, so you might not be able to learn, right, what we suggested in the beginning. Hefker is the same as stucca. It's not really the same as stucca because when I make something ownerless, right? If you think about it, if I'm giving away my clothing, I'm just thinking of an example, right? I have clothing I don't need anymore. Now I have two options, right? I basically declare them ownerless. I don't want them anymore. I sometimes, right? I might give them away to a friend who's not poor, right? But I'm just giving it to a friend because I know they'll appreciate them. Or I can give it away to poor people, right? That's hefker. Hefker, it's, it's all those are possibilities. Poor people can take them, not poor people can take them. Just because I'm making something ownerless doesn't mean I'm necessarily giving it to charity. So therefore, if you have an answer to the outlet stucca, that there is the outlet stucca, it's still not clear that that would apply to healthcare, and that's his question. By Ravina, question number five. This is a little bit different. Yes, yad the beta kise olo. I think this sounds like a strange question. Is there a yad, a law of yad for a bathroom or not? What on earth are they talking about? Well, hey, what's the case? You say this space, okay, let's say you're going on a camping trip and you designate an area where you say to your whole family, this is the area we're going to use for the bathroom right now for the weekend, okay, or for wherever, you know, wherever you're, okay, this area is designated as the bathroom space. So now, as soon as you designate it, that area, well, I'm going to say this, but maybe in a few minutes, we're going to change it a little, but that area becomes so to speak, designated as your bathroom space, even though it's never been used and there's nothing there yet, but you already can't recite Kriyat Shema there or you can't learn Torah there because it's already a space. Right? That can only be done in a place that is open to sanctity. A bathroom is the opposite of that. And therefore you can't use it anymore once it's designated. So the question is, right again, if I designate and said this area will be the bathroom and this also... Obviously, it all has the law of a bathroom. But my, I'm um, sorry, but Ella uh, Kigon de Amal, right? So in that case, the second one obviously becomes a bathroom. Ella Kigon de Amar Bahadin, Nami. But if you said this one, and right, you said this will be the bathroom and this, and you didn't finish your sentence, my, do we say Hadin de Amar Bahadin Nami Beta Kise? You know where this is going, right? And the second one, is it also a bathroom? Is that what you meant to say? Oh, Dilma, my vehaden, the Tashmisha Baalma Kama. Maybe you meant this is our bathroom and this will be for our use, right? We can talk in Kriyachma here. We can, right, do what we want here. This is not the bathroom space. So the question is, what, what could we, you know, what do we say? To which the Gemara says, wait a minute. And this is a question we had already on Rav Papa on the, on the Kiddushin case. Do you remember we asked for a papa? We said, when it comes to Kiddushin, you're asking about a yad, but you already said somewhere, right? Do you remember Rav Papa had said, does Shmuel really hold yad she'eno mochiach as a yad in Kiddushin? Which would sound like if a yad she'eno mochiach as a yad, and he's questioning that, it's obvious to him that a yad would be a yad. So it's the same kind of question here, although we don't have the same kind of answer. Because in the end, what did we answer there? That there, he was talking only according to Shmuel, but not according to his own opinion. He didn't even know if there was a yad at all. 
Shmuel was clear that there was a Yad, and then he started talking about Yad Shein Omuchach, right, an unclear Yad. But a clear Yad, Shmuel would think yes, but Rav Papa himself didn't think so, or wasn't sure about it. So now they say, but Ravina himself, okay, so there's going to be an assumption here that we're making. What is our assumption that we made? That if I designate something as a bathroom, even without having used it, I'm not allowed to dive in there. That was obvious. But now we're going to say, right, Michlal, from here you can infer what? Exactly that. That clearly, if you designate an area in a clear manner, not a yad, but an entire statement, and you say, this is a bathroom, that becomes a bathroom, you can no longer dive in there. Now, but Ravina specifically asked this question. He wasn't sure about this. He's mino le beta kise mau. If you designate a space as a beta kise, as a bathroom, but you never use it, you haven't yet used it, what's the status? He's mino le beta merchatz mau. You designate it as a bathhouse. It's also a space where you're not allowed to pray in, a designated space. With that zimun mo'ilo and zimun mo'ilo. Does the fact that I designate it, but it was never yet used, does that already make it a problematic space to pray in? So, how could Ravina be asking about a yad when it's not even clear about the basic halacha? To which the Gemara answers, Ravina chadomigo chada kamibayim. He was asking a question within a question, just like we had the Intin Saloma before. It's the same kind of thing. Zimun mo'elo ain't zimun mo'elo. His first question was, does zimun work or not work? Designating it, does the designation work or not? Is it effective? Intin Saloma, if you want to say, again, this is right, like a flow chart. If you go this way and you say, yes, Zimun is Mo'il, yes, Zimun, then I have a further question, which is, if you're going to go on that track, yes, Yad, oh, and Yad. Are, is Yadayim going to work there or is it not going to work? Okay, so basically, it's a question within a question. To which the Gemara answers, Tibayle. You would have expected it to say Teku, which is what we're used to from the Gemara, which means the question will stand. But in fact, here they use a different language, which is, one of the places where we see already that Nidarim has its own language that's not necessarily used in most other Masechta. Talked about this in the introduction. Tibayle is another way of saying, right, this is not known. Let us be wanting for this, okay? Tibay is to want or to need. Like, we need an answer. We don't have an answer, okay? So for all these questions, really, we don't have an answer. I want to just point out an interesting thing. Since we have a little time today, I want to point out a bunch of interesting things along the way. An interesting methodological points. If you noticed yesterday, when we had that exact same question to Rav Papa, it was the same type of question. What, how, right? Your question presumes that right, you don't know about a Yad, but something else you said elsewhere seems to indicate a Yad is definitely be- relevant to Kiddushin, and the question is only about a Yad chain of Muchach. And the answer was, if you remember, there was a bit of a problem with the language. It said, <laughs> We said the word Chada didn't really seem to belong, and some people take it out. Say it doesn't really belong here. Now I want you to notice his words and notice the words we answer here. In our answer here, which was the same type of question, it had a totally different answer because there it was Ravina himself and it wasn't right in that place. It was Rav Papa talking about Shmuel and therefore we could just say, oh, it was about Shmuel. But here it says, Chada migo chada kamibai. You see the chada with the migo. So it's very possible that when they were copying the transcripts, right? These were all written and, and scribes would write them. The mistake got made by someone who accidentally, the chada appeared before the word migo in that answer. And accidentally he added the chada before the migo in this answer, even though right, migo just translates as from, right? Mitoch, from this we can, that. So from means different things and the chada has not, right? One from within another is the answer here. There the one had nothing to do with it. It was just from what Shmuel had said, he was asking, but not about his own opinion. So the Chada probably got there by accident because of this. Okay. Next section. We're done with that section. We're done with Yadot, which is good. We're moving on to more, though, complicated language things, which again, why is this so complicated? Because it's unclear to us. It's also, by the way, it was unclear to them who were learning this, exactly what makes each language specifically mean this or that, because language is so specific to a generation. To pe- it's, it's such a specific thing how people use language. If you think about how language has changed from when, when you know, 30 years ago, language was different. We're, we're very sensitive to certain things in language that we weren't sensitive to then. Then we were probably sensitive to other things that we're not sensitive to anymore. And language use changes. So it's a very complicated subject to learn because 
different people, it's made up of different people living in different places, using different languages, and, and we who have a different sensitivity to the language in general. So it makes this section very complicated to understand because they're doing all these nitpicky things about a particular word, about a particular phrase. And because of that, it leads to many different interpretations of what all this means. You remember now the last line in the Mishnah was minu dani lecha. So we had all the yado, which we've been dealing with about mufrashni, muruchakni, all that. We had Shmuel who said, it's only if you combine muruchakni with shani lecha. And then we had Rabbi Akiva in the language of minu dani lecha. If you use the language minu de, which is usually a connotation of nidoi, which is a type of excommunication. Rabbi Akiva hayachochech bezelachni. He seemed to lean toward being stringent. It's very interesting language. The interpretation is what the chochech means, but we're just going to interpret it as he deliberated and said, let's just be more stringent. So therefore, the first thing the Gemara does is Amar Abai, Abai says, Modi Rabbi Akiva lin yamal kochei Rabbi Akiva must admit though, that if you don't keep your vow, you actually don't get lashes for this. If you send minudani lecha, because the king nene Rabbi Akiva machmil. If he wanted to say Rabbi Akiva was stringent, he would have simply said in the Mishnah, Rabbi Akiva machmir. The fact that it says he deliberated and leaned toward being stringent, that means, well, we're not going to punish you though, because maybe you really didn't mean neder. And it leaves open possibilities, which means you're not going to get punishment unless, you, unless you're definitely deserving of it. Since he wasn't sure and left it open. So yes, we'll be stringent, we'll consider it a vow, but you won't get lashes if you go against your vow. Now we're going to have a machlok at Rav Papa and Rav Chista about what language exactly are they del deliberating about. Bin and here we're going to get very trivial or very um, detail-oriented about particular uses of language. Binedina minech, which is a root of nidoi, but it seems to be saying the whole root of nidoi is like a nida. A nida, why is she called a nida? It comes from this language because you're supposed to distance yourself from your wife when she's a nida. So nidina minech, if you use the phrase and you say nidina instead of minudani lecha, like in the Mishnah, but you say nidina minech, seems to say, I'm distancing myself from you. Nobody thinks it's forbidden. Now, it's interesting why exactly this is. It's not so clear. Tosva gives a certain interpretation, which I think is kind of unique. But Tosva says that nidina is not from the Lashon of Nidoy, but it sounds like navinad. Okay, navinad, a wandering, right? Wandering is kind of wandering off. That means detaching. It's a different language than nidoy, actually, or that nidoy comes from this navinad, and therefore it sounds like I'm detaching myself from benefiting from you. So if you say nidina minach, kule amalo pligidasu, even the rabbis will agree. That's a language saying, I'm distancing myself from you. I won't benefit from you, which is exactly what our neder is. Mishamtanaminach, which shamta was a typical method of excommunication in those days. There was shamta, nidoy, and cherem. There are different levels, each of them, but mishamtanaminach, if you use that language, nobody uses that language to connote anything other than excommunication. And therefore, kuleyama shari. In that case, even Rabbi Akiva will say, you clearly didn't mean to make a vow. You were really saying excommunication. So what's their machloket? The machloket is if you use the language of which could be understood in two ways. Rabbi Akiva says this is a language of detaching. Now an Amud Bet. And Rabbanan say, no, this is a language of shamta, of excommunication. Okay, so there's a debate do we think we mean you're detaching yourself, in which case I don't want to benefit? Or do we think that you mean I'm excommunicating myself from you, which is a different language, which doesn't mean I'm vowing not to benefit from you. Before we move on, again, because we have time, I want to go into these things. This is an opportunity to get to things we don't always get to. This is a big debate here among the commentaries. When we say, remember Shmuel came and said, so I mentioned it just a few minutes ago. He said, it's only if you use the word, Okay, so the Ran says, minudani lecha, when we say Rabbi Akiva's machmir, it's when he adds the words also, shani lecha. If you didn't say the word shani lecha, or something like that, right, shani lecha, then I'll benefit from you. If you don't add those words, then for sure it means excommunication has nothing to do with a vow, okay? And then 
all this, minuyami vacha, right, mishamtani, all that, and then it would be mishamtani, would be, even if you said the words of money, ochalacha, you still mean excommunication. Only minudeh could possibly could mean a vow because you added the word shani ochalacha. And then the rabbis disagree with that. That's the run. Tosvot says, no, no, no. We're talking here just minudani lacha by itself. We're not talking about that you added the word shani ochalacha. And then the Rasba says, well, if Tosvot is right, that it's only minudani lacha, and it's not with the words of ochalacha, then you would read the sugya as saying, it, and this is, I just want to show you how you can read this sugya in two different ways and come to very different halachic conclusions. According to Tosvot, the Rashba says, according to you, if it's just the words Menudani Lachat, there's a machloket about it, and then Mishamtana doesn't work, and, 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 right, then even if you add the words Mishamtana, Shani Ochelcha, you would say it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't, even you add, sorry, if you would add, sorry, if you would add Shani Ochalacha, then even with the wording of Shamta, it would be a vow. Okay, because it all depends on what you think this case, Minudani Lacha, that they're arguing about, that affects what the other cases will be. So let me just summarize because I don't feel like I said it clear enough. According to the Ran, we're talking about Minudani Lacha Shani Ochalacha. And then there's a machloket about it. If the rabbis think that's still the language of, of excommunication and not of a vow. And it's not a vow, even though you added the word Shani Ochalacha. But according to Tosfot, we're talking about just the words Menudani Lacha, there's a machloket, which means if you'd say Menudani Lacha or Misha, then even the rabbi, Eshani Ochalacha, and you added those words, which made it clear that you were doing a vow, it would be a vow even according to the rabbis. And if you did it with the Shamta language, even that would be a vow because you added the word Shani Ochalacha. So we get to different conclusions based on what we think this case is. It's all a matter, do we apply Shmuel to this as well? And since nobody talks, right, it doesn't say so in the Gemara, it op leaves open the door for different commentaries to assume different things. And then they each try to prove, you know, Tosfot's proof is Shmuel should appear here then, and he doesn't. And because he doesn't appear, it must be he doesn't comment here. And he only has it on those first cases. You know, the other option is to say, what do you mean? It's a parallel Mishnah. So, if, right, these this is just like Ruchakni. It's just that there's a debate about it. But Shani Ochalacha and, you know, to Shmuel's whole theory should apply to this just as well. So that's a big deliberation about how to understand this. Upliga de Rav Chista. Now they're going to say that Rav Papa, who thinks that the homach loket is only in the language of Nudani Lacha, but again, Mishamtana, everyone agree, everyone would agree, is definitely excommunication, not a vow at all. And that need, let me get it right, Nidina Minach would definitely mean a vow, according to everybody. But this disagrees with Rav Chista. Dahu Gavra. There was a case, we're going to learn from a case where Rav Papa ruled in a particular way. We're going to see that he, it, it, his way of deciding, you can see from his words what he thought about what there was a debate about. Dahu Gavra da'amal mishamtana b'nichse. Person said, you're going to be in shamta from, right, um, sorry, I will be in shamta. I'm putting myself in excommunication from your possessions. From the possessions of the son of Rav Yirmiyabar Abba. Some person, random person said this. Anta the Kameh of Chista. They came before Rav Chista to say, what's the story? Is this a vow? Is it not a vow? Um, so, I'm sorry, did I not say that? From the property of the son of Rav Yirmiyabar Abba. My mistake. Amar Lay, he said to him back, Rav Chista says, Late dechash laha de Rabbi, de Rabbi Akiva. Nobody really cares about Rabbi Akiva's opinion, which is interesting because the Mishnah only quoted his opinion. But he said, none of the rabbis nowadays are concerned for Rabbi Akiva's opinion. And therefore, it's not a Nedia. But what do you see here? He thinks that Rabbi Akiva and the rabbis disagree about what case when you say Mishamtana. So what do you see here? Kasavar be Mishamtana Pligi. If you have the, the, the study guide in front of you, you can see the, the debate here, right? It's very... Obvious that Mishamtana, according to Rav Papa, nobody disagreed about it. Everybody said that definitely is not a vow. But from the fact that Rav Chista said, this is not a vow because nobody cares about Rav Akiva's opinion. Again, not nobody cares, but nobody holds like Rav Akiva's opinion. So therefore, it's clear he holds that there's a debate about Mishamtana. So from there, you see that according to Rav Chista, there is a debate about Mishamtana, just like Minudani Lacha. And that disagrees with what Rav Papa said.
now that we had a whole discussion on Menu Daniel Ha and the law of you know, what it means when you say that. But the whole root of it comes from excommunication. They're now going to go off on a tangent. I actually had a whole bunch of sugyo way back when about nidoi and what it means to excommunicate. We're now going to have three, it's really four laws, but kind of the structure is three laws. Within one of them, we're going to learn about a fourth, three laws about excommunication in general. Okay, so first, just some basics. When someone's excommunicated, it means a few things, which is number one, you can't uh, cut your hair, you can't wear leather shoes, and people can't come within four cubits of you. People basically distance themselves from you. This is why if you say, you know, you're kind of distancing yourself from people. Um, oh, I wanted to point out one other thing. All oh, right, I forgot to point this out. This is very interesting. The toast folk comments on the first toast vote on, on Amu Bet in Bamai Pligi Bimenudani Lacha. He talks about what is exactly the machlok. And he says the following One could make an argument that if you say the words Minudani Lacha, now Minude has a very negative connotation because it means excommunication, right? We nowadays would use maybe the term or cherem. Someone's in cherem, we say. Now, think about yourself. If you wanted to, now it's hard to imagine because it's not like we usually use these terms in general in life. We don't take vows to distance ourselves from people and not to benefit from them. But part of the question is, did you mean when you said minude? Because nidoi involves distancing yourself four cubits from people, right? The people can't come within four cubits. Did you mean just, and if you remember, we had a study about this before. Did you mean only I want to distance myself four cubits from from you when you said minude anilacha? Or did you mean more like I don't want to benefit from you at all? So comes the Gemara and says, if you wanted to say, uh, comes to Tosfot and says, if you wanted to say, this is Rabbi Akiva's logic. If you wanted to say, or actually, no, sorry, I just got confused. It would be, second, right, okay, yeah, this is Rabbi Akiva's logic. If you want to say, I'm distancing myself four cubits, would you use the language menudani lacha? No. Because why would you ever want to say, right? Would you ever say, I'm putting myself in cherem? If, if you didn't mean, and first of all, right? It's, if you say I'm putting myself in nido, what you really mean maybe is I'm only distancing myself for cubits from you, but I can maybe benefit from your stuff or I mean nido or I mean something else. But you wouldn't use it if you wanted to say, I'm distancing myself for cubits from you. In other words, the, the Tosan understands that it would mean specifically I'm distancing myself four cubits from you if you're saying minudani lecha. Now, and you're using it as nidoi. So he comes and he says, it, you wouldn't use that language. You would have said, I'm distancing myself four cubits because why would you want to use the language about yourself using the word nidoi? It's, it's like a bad word. People don't like to say bad words, particularly about themselves. And therefore, the fact that you're using this must mean that you're using it to basically include all sorts of other things. If you wanted it to have the limited, you would have used a nicer language, which is a whole interesting theory. Again, this isn't necessarily the only truth, the only way to understanding it, but it's a particular way of understanding it. I want to show you here that I find these studio very complicated. I assume you do also because they're very unclear. It's what I said before, because we don't really understand the language they used. And, and, and even the, the people commenting in the Gemara didn't necessarily understand the language that was used in the time of the Tani. And the Rishonim didn't really understand the language. It's very hard to understand. But at least if we can take some theories of the commentaries, we can come up with theories. Everyone's trying to create their own theory about why this would be. So it's an interesting theory about we choose language that's not the most negative language possible. So if we are going to use that, it must be because we want to include something more. Okay, that's his theory about it. Okay, moving on now to Nidoi itself. Amar Rabbi Ila Amarav. Nidau bifanav em tirimo ela bifanav. So as I said, we're jumping now into real laws of Nidoi which is, again, a type of excommunication. So that was interesting. In the Quran, they use the word ostracism, okay, I guess, to distinguish it from shamta, they call it. Ostracism, okay, which would make sense in terms of this rihuk arba mo. But I'm just going to, for the sake of our class, I'll just call it excommunication. If you put someone in excommunication in, in, in front of them, you do it and you say, I'm excommunicating you. This would happen, by the way, in all sorts of situations. Somebody does something wrong, the rabbis have the power to excommunicate people. So if you do it in front of their face, then when you want to undo it, okay, you want to 
uh, dissolve the, the nidoi, you do it in front of them as well. Why this is, again, big deliberation among the rabbis, not so clear. Some people explain that it's humiliating to the person to do it in front of them. And therefore, to undo it, you should do it in front of them as well to kind of show respect that you're dissolving it. Some people look at that a little differently, have a little bit of a twist on that. I'm going to um, leave it at that, but could be, right? It could be also just, you know, a lot of things in our religion. When we do it in one way, we have to undo it in, a, in the same manner. Okay, it's like a method. It's a kind of the power to dissolve it is only the same way that it's, and I'm thinking of kashrut, kibolo kach polto, right? The same way, so it gets absorbed. That's how it gets, right? My daughter was just asking why we can't kashrut frying pans because, right, the, you can only kosher it by like, putting a strong fire on it because that's the way you cook things in it. That's the way you can kosher it. So it's almost similar. The way you do it is the way you can dissolve it as well. But again, there's many different interpretations. It's not so clear what the basis of this law is. But if you did it not in front of them, by the way, some people think that nidoy that you do to someone's face is just a more harsher nidoy, and therefore it's more difficult to dissolve it. It's another way of looking at it. But if it was not bifanav, not done in front of their face, you just kind of declared someone's in nidoy, then you don't have to do it in front of their face. Well, you know, in their presence, I would say is a better translation, not literally in front of their face, but it means in their presence. That's law number one. Law number two, Amarav Hanin Amarav, if you hear someone using God's name in vain, you need to excommunicate them. Okay? If you're an important person around and you see them, you have to excommunicate them because that's very serious. We take that very seriously. Someone uses God's name in vain. And if you didn't, then you yourself should be excommunicated. Whether it means you really are a nidoy or whether it means you deserve to be in Nidoy, it's probably more likely that option because you didn't respond and put them do the, with the proper actions. Therefore, you yourself are deserving to be in Nidoy. Now, this next line seems to come as a proof for that, but it's a little hard to understand how this works as a proof. Anywhere where God's name is mentioned in vain, we see poverty. Okay, Somebody becomes poor. Aniyut kimita, poverty is like death. There's a bunch of things that are considered like death. You see, tzara'at. leprosy is also considered like death. Where do we see this? A proof? When Moshe wanted, when God told Moshe to go back to Egypt after he ran away, why did he run away? Because he killed the, the right, he killed the Mitzri, and then he saw the two people fighting, remember? And then he was scared of Datan and Aviram. And, and they say, or well, not just that, he was scared of, right, the, sorry, Datan and Aviram told on him. And then there was a concern that, he was going to end up, right? The, the Egyptians were going to kill him. And then it says, It says, you can go back because all those people died. Now, they assume here they didn't really die. Whenever the rabbis look at someone, remember we always have those stories where the rabbi gazed at someone. It means the person's either going to die or they're going to be become poor. And basically, what we want to say here is they didn't really die. By the way, it's very similar to Vayamat Melech Mitzrayim. And then they, the Rashi there says, right, the Midrash, famous Midrash, he didn't really die. It was just, right, the Acham, there was a new king who didn't remember Joseph. So it was the idea that he just shifted his policies, apropos um, election day here. So he just shifted his approach and all of a sudden was like he didn't remember Yosef. So now we have the same idea, which is, these people died, but they didn't really die, okay? It was just that they kind of got lowered in importance because they became poor. Now, what does this have to do with the hazkarat Hashem Mitsuya Hashem Mitsuya? So it's not so clear. So it could be saying, if the rabbis put their eyes on someone, that means either death or poverty. What we prove for the psukim is death and poverty are equated. And then what it's basically saying is, if the rabbis look poorly upon you because you use God's name in vain, then you'll become impoverished. And that's um, that's basically what we're saying. So again, it's a little clear, unclear how we get to, if you don't put someone in Nidoy, you will become poor. Not 100% clear how that comes from here, but they seem to be associating, it's like an associated, associative connection between a bunch of these things. Because it doesn't really mention here anything about using God's name in vain. It's a little bit unclear. So basically we have two laws so far. 
if you put someone next communication in their presence, you have to undo it in their presence. If not, not. Um, you could, but you don't have to. If you mention God's name in vain, you have to put them in excommunication. And if you don't, you yourself deserve to be excommunicated. And now I'm a Rabbi Abba. We're going to have a story that relates to these two things. And within that, we're going to learn a third thing. And then in terms of our structure, we're going to learn a fourth thing, okay? Which is really in the structure. It's really a third thing. It's just that through this story, we're going to actually learn something additional. I'm a Rabbi Abba. I was in front of Rav Huna, probably in his court. You heard some woman. She used God's name in vain. Shamta. Rav Huna put her in excommunication. She, he immediately dissolved the, uh, the excommunication in front of her, in her presence. So Shema Minatla. The Gemara loves this statement, right? We learned three things from him. Three is always the magic number. Shema mina. We learn from here. As we saw, you hear someone use God's name in vain, you have to put them in excommunication. Why did he do it in her presence? Because he put her in excommunication in her presence and therefore had to dissolve it in her presence. By the way, which might explain why he rushed to do it now, to dissolve it immediately, because he was worried if he didn't, he would have trouble finding her later and he wouldn't be able to dissolve it. Ushma mina, very interesting halacha, which you might have been thinking about the story. It seems a little strange. Basically, what it's saying is as soon as you put someone in nidoy, you should immediately undo it. it. Seems very strange. Why would you dissolve your nidoy immediately after? So, for help on this, you might want to look at the Rambam in Hilchot Talmud Torah and Sefer Amada, the end of the last chapter, Perak Zion, he talks about nidoy. And he says basically our halachot about Bifanav, and he says, uh, he said, when we put someone in Yidoy, we put them in Yidoy, and we immediately dissolve it. But he adds three important words that aren't in the Gemara. When the person goes back to his good ways, meaning, what happened? They put someone in Yidoy to show you, this is like a parent, right? You punish your child, and then immediately after you undo it. But by punishing them at that moment, right? One might say maybe it's bad policy as parents to punish and then say, oh, I for forget it. But at that moment, when you punish your child, you've shown them, I take this very seriously, even if in another minute later you undo it. And in that moment, they feel bad, they do tshuva, and then you're good. So the Kesef Mishnah there, which is Rav Yosef Karo's commentary on the Rambam, he wrote the Shulchan Aruch, he likes to bring the sources. So on this line, if you look in this line, he says, says, where did he get this from? He says, uh, Pashutu. It's just obvious. <laughs> okay? And that's where we get it from. It's just obvious that it must be the only reason we'd be undoing it. By the way, the Ramam says in the next line that if you want to, though, if you have a really evil person who's not changing their ways, you can leave him excommunicated for many years. So it doesn't mean you always do it right away, but in most cases, the person gets the message right away. Amar of Gita Lamara. Last halacha for today. Tamichacham can both put himself in excommunication and can then undo it, dissolve it himself. Pshita, to which the Gemara says it's obvious, even though I wouldn't say it's so obvious, but the Gemara thinks it's obvious, to which is saying, no, no, it's not so obvious. Right. Someone, if you're handcuffed by someone else, right, you, or even if you handcuff yourself and put yourself in jail, you can't really get yourself out of jail by yourself. So maybe it's true he put himself in it, excommunicated himself, but maybe he wouldn't be able to undo it himself. Well, Kamash Malanda, he can't. To which the Gemara says, hey, Dami, what's the case? And they're going to quote a bit of a strange case. And this again is going to lead to different interpretations about how to read this. So here's Marzutra Chasida, Marzutra the Chasid, Kimachai Bar Rav Shamta, whenever he would have to put a Tamil Chacham into Nidoy, which he didn't really want to do because, you know, Covered a Torah and it's not the greatest thing. Well, Mishamit Nafshe Berish. He would first excommunicate himself. Many different interpretations why he did this. Maybe because of Kvoda Torah, maybe because he, he wanted to show this isn't a great thing that we have to excommunicate a Tamil Chacham. Or maybe he felt he needed atonement for putting a Tamil Chacham in excommunication. The best explanation I saw was Rabbeinu Tam because it really explains the end of the story, which you'll see in a minute, which is he did it so as not to forget to undo it. Okay, now here we'll see why he says this. And this, so he basically would excommunicate himself as well. So first he would excommunicate himself. 
then he would excommunicate the Talmud Chacham. And when he would get to his house, he didn't want to be, and this is why Rabbi Rabbeinu time makes a lot of sense, he wouldn't want to be distanced from his family members, so he would immediately shari lenafshe. He would undo his own excommunication. shari and then he would undo the other. It would remind him to undo the other as well. If you go with the other interpretation, you have to explain why he would undo it and undo the other. But anyway, it could be like we saw before. But you just want to do it for a short period of time to send a message. Now, there's a very interesting thing. And the the wrong quotes both sides. I just want to end with this again because there's a lot of interesting things here in terms of how you use the Gemara as a way to come to halachic conclusions. So the Gemara said something very simple, which is a Tamil Chacham who puts himself in excommunication can undo it. We thought they meant because he did something wrong. The quote, the case they quoted to prove it was a person who really didn't do anything wrong, unless you say it was really bad that he put someone in excommunication, but you can't really say it was bad, he was supposed to. So even if you say it was a little, he needed atonement, but still, he didn't do anything wrong that really deserved excommunication. So the case was, where he undid it was specifically in a case where he wasn't really deserving of it. So the Rashba says it can only be dissolved by the same Tabichacham himself if it's something more like Marzutra did it, where he did it for some extraneous reason, but not because he really was deserving of it. The Ramam says, no, that doesn't make any sense, even though that was the case they brought. You don't learn from that specific case. And he basically says, this is any Tabichacham, even if he did something wrong and put himself in excommunication, he can actually dissolve it himself. So there's a debate based on, right, the Gemara brings a halacha that's very general, brings a story that's very specific. Is that specific story telling you it's only in those specific details or could it be more broad reaching than the story was itself? So that's the question, the deliberation between the Rashba and the Rambam. If you want to read it inside, you could look at the Ran, where he quotes both opinions. With that, we'll finish for today. And for those voting today, go out and vote. <laughs> those who have elections. Have a great day, everyone.